Eric, can you come to the podium, please? I'm ready. Lightning's all starting. Three, two, one, go. All right, so I'm Eric Hodel. I am here to talk to you about the next release of RDoc, RDoc 3.10. Um, if your internet works, you can go to segment7.net, till Dr. Brain, RDoc, and look at uh, a preview. So one of the, I think the biggest thing that I've added is I've got uh, two new markup formats. I have the super ancient RD format, which is here at the bottom, and then I've implemented Tom Preston Warner's TomDoc, and he'll be talking more about TomDoc tomorrow. I believe it's in this room at 2.10, and other stuff for GitHub. Um, I'm going to add Markdown real soon. I've got all of the groundwork laid. I just need a parser that I can put into Ruby core, and so there's that adds a lot of restrictions to what I, how, it, how it can be written. To choose which, uh, which markup that your file is in, you can either, when you run rdoc, do rdoc dash dash markup tomdoc, and you can put that in your options for your gem as well. Uh, that'll work with, I think, with back to 192, the, the rdoc that's in 192. It'll look funky, but it will still operate just fine. You can also put a uh, comment at the top of your file or above a method in order to mark that method or that file as all being tomdoc. And I'm also going to add a magic file that you add options to, and I don't know what that looks like yet. Uh, for the HTML view, I've integrated the search from sdoc. So you've got, and I've slightly improved the index, so you can type things like a cl full class name fully qualified. Uh, it's also a reusable component. So I've got a patch to integrate that back into sdoc. And uh, if you're writing your own generator, you can use that as well. It's fairly easy to integrate. I haven't fully documented how to do it yet. So there are no more of the, the file pages where you'd click on the side and it would be this useless page that had like the time it was modified and it was mostly blank. And also on the rest of the pages like your readme or your history file, or your change log, there's no more extensions on those. So that's no, those now are all called pages. And if you have like the equals foo for your heading or whatnot, all those have labels. And so you can deep link to those with the at sign. So if you type in your, your comment, uh, see rdoc markup at links, it'll put a link to that f with the full name. There's also some syntax highlighting in the uh, HTML output. It's only for Ruby code. And I do some super basic guessing by seeing if there's one of these keywords or a block call or a hash arrow in the, in the block. And uh, it needs some feedback to see, hey, this should be highlighted and it's not so that I can, I'm, I don't really have a good way to tell that something is Ruby or not. There's also, you can copy static files into RDoc, so if you have a PDF or you have a directory of images or something that you want to include, you can go and list those. And that if you give a directory, it'll copy the directory structure. If you give just a file, it'll put that file in the root of the output dir. The table of contents has been separated out into his own page, and it shows headings with a little disclosure triangle or disclosure button. It's all HTML5. And it should be out next week, and you can uh, install the pre-release now. And so uh, let's go look at this page. Uh, we got we got two minutes. We got a demo. Oh, wow, that's like a long ways away over there. Uh. Oh, never mind. It's too hard. Cool. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about Builder, or BLDR, um, a JSON templating DSL that I wrote. So um, I'm Alex Sharp, AJ Sharp on Twitter. Um, I am a Ruby engineer at a company called Zarly. Um, Zarly is a um, sort of buyer-centric local commerce platform. So it's sort of like a reverse Craigslist. Um, we enabled you to like go on the app and say what you want, how much you'll pay for it, and um, other people in your area can like fulfill it. So um, the app is heavily a API driven. I do um, almost exclusively backend server work. Um, the app is pretty much exclusively Sinatra. Um, and we have a native iOS client, Android web, HTML5 mobile. Um, so all of them talk to a JSON API. And currently, um, we only support JSON. Eventually, we're, we're going to open up the API, but um, I'm hoping to keep XML out. Um, so why write another JSON templating library? Um, mostly because as JSON gets unwieldy really, really quickly, um, you could probably make a pretty strong argument that um, JSON serialization doesn't belong in the model 
and um, there's a lot of, quite a few other um, templating libraries out there already. Um, the reason that we didn't go with any of these is mostly just the DSLs didn't really make sense to me, and um, I found them kind of con confusing. Um, and we, we just need, like we need, it's, it's important for us to see exactly what we're returning in our responses um, because we're a commerce platform and you know, when money is involved, people are very, very sensitive about that. Um, which brings me to my next point. So, um, you know, we, I, I joined the company about five months ago. Um, the app had been in development for maybe a couple of months. We were moving really, f really quickly. Um, we launched in like mid-May. And um, admittedly, we were doing just a lot of as JSON um, attributes and, uh, you know, sending them to the client. Um, I'm sure we're not the first people to do this. Um, so, turns out, um, so we, we use MongoDB on the back end and Mongoid for the, um, for the o ORM or ODM or whatever. And so, turns out Mongoid like sort of recursively serializes stuff, whether or not you put it in include. I, I, I don't know if that was like a bug or, or, or whatever. Um, so uh, someone figured this out and sent it to TechCrunch, and so this was not good. That sucked. Um, so uh, luckily we got we got things patched in about 15 minutes. Um, after that, it was like okay, we need a better solution. So um, I wrote this DSL. It's really really simple. Um, currently, it only works with Sinatra. I was I've been trying to get Real, Rails 3 support going. Um, I just have been having a little trouble with the Action View stuff. Um, so if you're good at that stuff, um, maybe come find me. I'll, I'll be sitting in the back after this. And, and um, it's, I, the, the part that I don't have working is just getting instance variables and locals over to the templates. Um, so the thing that I really like about this is there's really only, I don't know what just happened, but I think it was funny. <laughs> Tenderlove is playing hijinks up here. Um, so uh, there's really only four methods, object collection, attribute, and attributes. Um, so here's what, um, the, what you would put in like your Sinatra action, um, and it takes a little local hash. And so this is like the simplest possible thing you could do, right? Um, just key of foo and renders bar would be the local that we sent over here. Um, we also support like attribute lists, so this will just send those symbols to the object that you're, that you're um, rendering. Um, we, uh, we also have this like implied object thing where if you send the template a local called post, it'll try to invoke these attributes on that. All right, I'm gonna speed up. Um, we also have dynamic attributes so where you can like pass a block to attribute. Um, we have object nesting, which, you know, like what you would expect from something like this. So you can do like this singular objects nested as deeply as you want. Um, you can do like attribute aliases. Um, Obviously, there's also support for top-level collections um, for multiple resources, uh, and you can deeply nest collections as well. Um, there's a couple other cool things about it. It uses multi-JSON, so you can pick the encoding library you want. It uses uh, Yagile by default if it's available, um, and I, I don't know what multi-JSON defaults to if Yagile's not around, but probably JSON gem or something. Yeah, so you don't want to use that. Um, we also... I also do this thing called builder.handler. Um, like I said, we use Mongo. Bison does this really weird serialization thing, and that's it. So this is like a global thing. Three, two, one, if you want more info, here it is. Um, AJ Sharp slash builder. Thanks. I'm gonna be talking about monitoring. Rather boring subject since, I mean, most people do Ruby for like Rails and other stuff. But um, me, I'm Ken Robertson, or K Robertson on Twitter and uh, GitHub. I work at a company called Demand Base in San Francisco. Um, I had to throw in the hiring thing because I went to Gogoruku and our stat HR person got mad at me because I didn't put us on the job board. She sent me home crying. Um, so I threw that in here for her. But she really is normally nice. Um, so I'm going to be talking about DevOps. Who else here is like using Ruby for DevOps? So I come from DevOps from more of a developer background. So looking at some of the operations things, I throw a big what the fuck sometimes to Nagios. I mean, it's this thing that really hasn't changed in a long time. Like, here's a, pic, here's a screenshot from Netscape, and it basically looks exactly the same. Um, <laughs> it hasn't changed over the years. You kind of have a love-hate relationship with it, um, especially looking at it from kind of a developer perspective. 
So I look at it a lot of times like, you know, it has this great community with a lot of plugins out there, but they're written in different things from Perl, Bash, um, some in Ruby, and different types of requirements. You know, how do you figure out what, you know, modules it depends on and everything like that, and you really have no idea about the quality of it. Like, these are the things monitoring your production systems, and do you know how well it was written or really review what it's doing? Um, some of them can be a lot of code that you really just don't know kind of how they went through it. So I decided to write something that I decided to call Metis. Metis implements Nagios' uh, NRPE protocol. It's a persistent Ruby domain, uh, Damien, so you write in your monitors and it keeps them live in memory. Um, it receives connections, says I want to run this monitor. It runs through your code, returns a result. Um, anytime you want to push out new changes, it just restarts. Um, with that, you're able to leverage gems. Um, Ruby has a you know, diverse set of gems, so you're able to pull, pick and pull anything you want, easily manage your dependencies, um, deploy it all kind of on a common language. Uh, it provides a simple framework for a lot of the common stuff you need to do. Like a lot of the checks, you look at it and they have a block of code for their you know, argument handling and then this little teeny section for what it actually does. And when you write your custom ones, then you gotta like remember the right exit codes for whether it's a warning, critical, or unknown. Um, and one of the things I also look at it is, is adding support for test helpers. If these are the things monitoring your live systems, you should be able to test them to make sure, you know, you're not waking up at 2 a.m. for some benign reason or that something doesn't slip through and not find out till 6 a.m. when, you know, your CTO is like, what the hell? So here's kind of um, how I've structured it as like a, a DSL, um, borrowing a lot from Chef, um, where you can define a monitor, give it a name, pass it an execute block with just some simple logic right in there. You define your return code as either critical, warning, or you can just say okay or return a string. But in here, of course, there's still some hard-coded parameters. So you can easily pull those out to attributes that can be dynamically configured. So here you just swap those out for um, something that you can dynamically pass when the domain, when the domain starts up. Uh, here's one a little bit more complicated where it's uh, connecting to your database server to see if replication is behind. A um, few of the things like it'll intelligently look at um, what your return code is, code is. So if you specify something's critical, but then you maybe run over a warning block, it'll know critical is more important than a warning and make sure that bubbles up. Uh, it'll rescue any exceptions that maybe throw so, and return the message from there. Um, and it also manages your dependencies to where you can put require gem and it'll just dynamically require it before running it and that way um, return that as a code if it's not there. Um, I haven't actually implemented this part yet, um, but this is how you can kind of write a test around it. Um, you know, you can, might have to mock some of it, yeah. But um, kind of looking for somewhat of a structure more like rat test, where you can set up some mocks or whatever you maybe need, um, tell it to run monitor, and then check your status code um, and the return message afterwards. Uh, if you're interested in it, it's up on GitHub. Um, you can just do gem install Metis. I pushed up the first version last night. Um, and it's still fairly young, but we're using it live on some of our systems and definitely looking for help with it. Thank you. Okay, I'm ready. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, I'm gonna talk to you about startups and why startups fail. Uh, I'm gonna talk about this uh, using as my backdrop a book called The Four Steps to the Epiphany by Steve Blank. Steve Blank is a veteran of eight Silicon Valley startups. His last startup was very successful, and he uh, had enough money after that startup. What's going on here? Okay, that's very interesting. <laughs> that's all very interesting. Okay, I can talk about this without using the slides if I have to. So, all right. He was a veteran of eight Silicon Valley startups over the course of 20 years. His eighth startup was very successful. And after that startup, he reflected on what he learned from those startups. Some were successful, some failed, and he looked at the patterns, what succeeded and what did not. Uh, those reflections led to lecture notes. Those lecture notes, he took those and delivered those in lectures at Stanford, Berkeley, and Columbia, and eventually he put those together in a book called The Four Steps to the Epiphany. Now, he defines a startup as an organization that's designed to find a profitable, scalable business model. You're going out there to find a way to make money. So there are a couple of things you want to do. First, you want to reduce risk. 
The reason you want to reduce risk is because you want to increase longevity. The longer your startup lasts, the greater the chance that you'll find a way to make money. Now, he starts off with a few counterexamples of companies that did not follow his four steps and did, did not succeed. Who remembers Webvan? Raise your hand if you remember them. All right, you buy your groceries on the web, they ship them to you in a van. They failed miserably because they spent a ton of money up front before they had a steady supply of customers. They put money into things like, uh, oh, custom-built software and uh, vans and warehouses and things like that. But they're not alone. Apple did the same thing with the Newton. Motorola did the same thing with Iridium. All of us make mistakes. So Steve Blank looked at all of this and came up with these four steps, four things we need to do if we want to be successful with a startup. Customer discovery, customer validation, customer creation, and company building. Notice that the first three focus on the customer first, and then we pump money into building the company. Now, who here is an entrepreneur? Raise your hand, make some noise, be an entrepreneur. Okay, good. I'm an entrepreneur too, and you know what? We're all delusional. We're delusional. <laughs> We're delusional because we think our idea will change the world, and maybe it will. What we need to do is take our idea, our idea bundle it into a minimum viable product, something that a customer might buy, put it out in front of them, and see if they, they buy it. Uh, we need to get outside of the building, talk to real people who have the money to pay for whatever it is we're offering. Now, the people we're going to target are the people at the left end of the bell curve. Imagine this is a curve of customers. At the left end are the people who are the early adopters, innovators. They buy iPhones when iPhones first come out. At the right end are the people who use dial-up telephones today. So we want to go after those early adopters, get feedback from them. Whatever we do in our MVP in that minimum viable product, our hypothesis, our guess, will not survive customer feedback. So we take that and we figure out what, what we're going to do to make a better product. Second step, customer validation. If that doesn't work, we pivot. Keep one foot per firmly in the area that you know and move to, to uh, and change those things that did not work out for you. Third step, customer creation. You're spending money. Is that one minute? Okay. One and a half. Okay. Customer creation. You spend money on marketing and, and sales to create more of those customers. You're moving down the bell curve, away from your early adopters and your innovators. You want to keep them, but you want to move into the meat of the bell curve. And finally, company building. This is where you put money into your warehouses and your custom software and building that infrastructure or building a larger company that's going to make money for you. This is post startup. So to recap, we're at the end of the presentation. The four steps that we want to follow to build a successful startup, according to Steve Blank, are customer discovery, customer validation, customer creation, and company building. We focus on the customer first, and then we pump money into building the company. We present a minimum viable product to the customer. If it doesn't work, we pivot into something that does. That's me. Thank you very much for listening. Right. OK, so my name's Ernie Miller. I write stuff. I tweet stuff, I code stuff. Um, next slide. So first up, I promised this slide would be here. Uh, blame Ben. Uh, there's a lot of smart people here. The talk is, you should write a Ruby gem. And I'm thinking there's probably a lot of people in this room already doing that. So just pick up a silent another Ruby gem. Anyway, you can see it's his fault. But if you already are writing Ruby gems, or if you just don't like what I got to say, uh, that's OK. I brought alternative entertainment. He'll be hanging out with us for the rest of the time. <laughs> so right. Awesome. So I write gems. I wrote uh, Meta Search because I liked object-based searching and I wanted it to work in Rails 3. Wrote MetaWare because I liked all the arrow awesomeness and I couldn't get to it without uh, hackery. Um, I wrote Ransack because Meta Search sucked. Uh, I wrote uh, I wrote Squeal because uh, MetaWare sucked. Um, I also wrote uh, Atro Bucket, which is just this little kind of toy gem for serialized attributes that make them act more like uh, typical model attributes. So anyway. There's also other reasons you might want to write gems. Uh, for instance, if you guys remember this awesome thread on GitHub where we discussed the merits of adding object in and inside and outside, and you know, it was it was pretty epic. I mean, it was no coffee script thread, but it was pretty great. So, um, so anyway, yeah, you get the idea, right? Um, so I wrote a gem called Naughty, and uh, you can see it has extensive uh, extensive specs uh, there on the bottom. So in, in, in Brian's defense, I mean, you know, there were specs. So you can write gems to be a troll as well. So that's awesome. Um, also, uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, there was like a new watcher just the other day. I'm pretty sure he did it just so I had to make a new slide. Um, so you should write gems too. 
Why should you write gems? Well, because reusable code is awesome, and to write a gem, you have to make your code reusable. Well, factored code is awesome. You'll probably factor your code better if you're writing a gem. Awesome times n is awesome for values of n greater than one. So you're sharing your awesome code with other people. Also, one more bullet point with awesome, because I was on an awesome roll. You'll learn stuff by writing gems. You can give lightning talks about your gem, see, if you're doing it. So, and you know, I don't have to tell you guys that. So anyway, why wouldn't you write gems? Well, people will see your code, and maybe it's like top secret and awesome, and you don't want anybody else to know your super secret algorithms. Or no, really, people will see my code, and like that could really suck for my reputation. Um, so everyone rolls their own maybe solution and you don't want to make a gem out of it or someone's done it better or it's just too trivial to bother with. So that was actually one of my things when I wrote a gem called Valium. Now, this talk's not about Valium, but what this talk is about is what you can find out about whenever you write these tiny little gems and you find out, you get some surprising results. So anyway, uh, this is what Valium does, bypasses active record instantiation. It's seriously, ridiculously simple gem. Uh, sample usage because you have to do that. Um, this talk's not about value, as I said. It's called You Should Write a Ruby Gem, just a reminder. Um, so look, we're information rich in this talk. We have all sorts of information here. Basically, what I'm trying to show is the fact that you, you can kind of see I'm spending a lot of time on some of these gems. I get a 570 watchers after 19 months on meta search, whatever. It really doesn't matter. Moving on. Um, so Valium, I spent about a month. Uh, uh, basically, it's been out for about a month, I should say. It's 91 lines of code. Uh, it has 196 watchers as of like this morning anyway. And so I was like, what? what? Like, seriously, why? It's 91 lines of code. And so what I learned was, especially after I saw this comment right here, um, so this was a comment on my blog. You can read it. I, what's obvious to me, basically, a lesson learned was that I thought you know, I was doing something obvious. It obviously wasn't so obvious to other people. Uh, you can't predict what other people are going to find useful. So you really shouldn't ask yourself, should I release this? Just release whatever it is you're thinking of releasing. And the internet is awesome at telling it, you it either sucks or it rocks. So also, I mean, people love free stuff anyway, and you're giving them free stuff. So, you know, like the kitten there. Um, so write a gem. You can use Bundler. You can use Jeweler. You can use Ho. I mean, Ho. Um, <laughs> It really doesn't matter, uh, just write a gem. So that's all I've got, thank you very much. And uh, all right, I was, told, I was told there would be sound. Unfortunately, you can hear it. Hi, I'm Corey Haynes. I, uh, with FabledNet, build mercuryapp.com. I also do code retreats, and we have a cat. Um, Ernie said to write a gem, so I did. And I'm giving a lightning talk about it. Um, so tweet something with RubyConf. Um, so last Saturday I was fooling around with gems and somebody said this, a friend of mine. Somebody said, hey, tweet. Um, they said, hey, you know, less people is a fine term if you work at the Soylent Green Factory. And so I wrote a, a Twitter bot called Pedantic Snob that replies whenever somebody says less people and tells them they should have said fewer. And it was really funny for about a half an hour. Um, <laughs> And so I'm going to demo it real quick. Um, what? Yes. So, so this is the code. I wrote a gem for building Twitter bots. So basically you just say configure. If you can't see it, go to my GitHub account. Oh, sorry. Um, you, can, you just say tweet bot configure. You say how often you want to do it. And then you say respond to this phrase and you give it a series of responses. And then you give it your auth keys and you say talk and it works, and it just starts responding to you. Um, so I did that and had a bunch of people telling me to fuck off. <laughs> um, so it was really funny. Um, it was really funny, but then I realized I woke up in the morning and had a whole stream of people telling me to fuck off, and I especially like this one who told me to, uh, um, how about you suck my dick? <laughs> and there was somebody who said to do it the long way backwards, and I started meeting the people who actually participate in trending topics. Um, so, I, so I built a couple called Today is Great and um, also one called Joy to You that listened for good morning, and then it said things like, hey, remember how awesome you are, and have a good day. And so I started getting people saying, oh, thank you, thank you. You really made my day, and this just made my day. And so I woke up Monday morning and had a whole stream of people telling me they love me. 
And so then they got suspended. Um, so I want to I wanna bring this up again. These people all told me to fuck off because I was telling them that they were wrong. These people all loved me. I had 500 followers in like a day. So I encourage you to write Twitter bots, but I don't encourage you to write mean ones. Be nice and imagine if there was a whole minion army of bots that were saying nice things to people. And I've made it really simple to do it. So you can go like this and just make really nice things. Has anybody had this reply to him yet? Yes. Pretty awesome, huh? Even on the Is it on the screen? Yes. Awesome. So that's what I'm going to say. Um, I used it as a way to learn about the Twitter stream thanks to the Twitter gym and to the Entridia tweet stream gym. Um, things that are better. Um, I don't handle rate limits that great, so I get suspended. Um, I need to figure out how to do better async things with Event Machine. Um, there's some configuration options that would be nice, like what happens when you wake up, um, things like that, as well as accepting a proc for giving the response text instead of just strings. Um, here's the GitHub account. Um, that's also our cat. So, oh, thanks very much. All right, 7 a.m. waking up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday, Friday, getting on down on Friday. Everybody's looking forward to lightning talks. Yes! <laughs> Hi, I'm Aaron Patterson. I am also known as Tender Love. I gave this talk about six years ago, so uh, sorry for the repeat. It was my first lightning talk ever. Yes, yeah, sorry for the repeat. I wrote this thing called Betabrite, and you can buy a sign. It's a sign like this, and then you can do gem install Betabrite. And if you want to write stuff onto the sign, there's two steps to do it. You have to allocate memory and then write to the memory. So you allocate once, and then you write many times, and the code looks like this. This allocates memory, so we're allocating two slots of memory here, a text, a text slot and a string slot. And then when you want to write to it, you just address those slots by name and then write to it. So this example program produces a goodbye, cruel world. And there's three different types of files, text, string, and dot files. So when you have a text file, you can embed string files into the text file. So it looks something like this. This is our text file, and it can have text on either side, so goodbye and world. And then we insert into the middle of that a string file so we can replace that. And the main difference between te text files and string files is that you can display string files without refreshing the sign. So if you display a text file, it has to blank the sign first. So that's why we want to use string files if possible. So this is how we write the text file. And in the middle here, we're embedding the string, the string file in the middle. So and then we write to the string file. And then you can just update the string file over and over again and have that dynamically changed so we have goodbye cruel world and that'll get replaced with uh, goodbye nice world. So you should use it and you can use it via DRB. One of the projects I did with that, I set up a server like this um, and that has some wrong code in it but that's okay. And it captures, it captures I set up a, a uh, webcam to capture an image of it and it would return the image over DRB and your client would look like this and this code would produce a sign, uh, an image like this. It would actually come back to your machine. And one of the best things was that somebody put together a um, website where they, they, his, his wife taught third grade or something like that. And he put all the students' names onto the sign and then put together a website which showed all the students' names, and then you could click through them, and that made me very happy. He shared it with me. <laughs> and then you can also, my other project with it is a Twitter client, as you can see right here. This is the code for it. It's, it's not as short as Corey's, but it uses no third-party libraries. So uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, all this, does, all this does is it's written with NetHttp, and it listens to um, it listens over HTTP to the, the uh, Twitter streaming service. 
and it writes messages onto a queue like this, and then we have another thread over here that just reads off of the queue and updates the sign. And I put together a video just in case this didn't work, but it does work, so you don't need to watch the video, you can just watch the sign. If you tweet with RubyConf, it'll show up here. Thank you. I gave a talk at Gogoruko where I came out and said you're all a bunch of homophobic, sexist, racist bigots which some people didn't take well, but there's science behind it. If you want to talk to me later, there's studies that show you have biases you don't like admitting. Um, but if you know you have them, you can kind of try to counter them. And some people argued about that, and someone argued with Josh that there's no, there's no discrimination in our field, otherwise Dennis wouldn't have made it off the stage and drag. So apparently the discrimination is either you kill someone or there's none of it. And I kind of disagree with that. Uh, I think as long as, as I said, there are closeted, high-profile community members, there might be some discrimination going on. And people complain about not being able to hire women and minorities, but they can say it couldn't possibly be anything to do with them. And I wanted to give some more people some input on this one, so. Play. Hello. Hello, my name is Renee Devorsney. I'm a programmer and I'm a woman. I'm not one of the guys. I expect respect at work. I want to be respected as a woman and as a programmer. Have a level of professionalism that shows respect to yourself and all your colleagues. There's a problem when I'm expected to always be the one to call out the sexist crap that gets said in front of me just because I'm the only woman present. There's also a problem with the notion that if I don't call you out on it, it's okay. There's no such thing as implied consent. Let's fix this. Men out there, if you see it, call your colleagues out. Be aware and demonstrate that you expect your peers and subordinates to be professionals. Thank you. So I was also going to have a black guy and a gay guy give videos, but they fell through. So out of like three guy, two guys, the woman was the only one that came through. Just putting that out there. Um, <laughs> it, there's discrimination. We have it. Uh, and basically our culture is kind of like a, a bunch of frat boys, honestly. And we kind of all know it, might want to deny it, but if you think or sit around like when you're drinking and joking around, it's pretty misogynist sometimes. And we could be better about it. Sure, there's a supply problem. There aren't enough women to hire, but it's not that bad of a supply problem. There's a reason that there aren't the women to hire. And it doesn't help that a friend pointed out his little girl was asked, hey, daddy, what are you doing? He's like, I'm programming. And he said, do you want to program when, she grow when you grow up? And she said, no, I want a boy job. Um, yeah, that's a culture-wide thing, but part of the culture is our culture. Is that two minutes? So we really could be a lot more inclusive. And part of the problem is don't argue with someone when they say, hey, maybe that doesn't help. If you make some comment like, oh, the problem is women need to step up, and you say girls, sorry to pick on the one guy. I'm a, I like him. He, he was made an innocent comment. And someone says, hey, maybe that's not the most inclusive way to say that. Arguing with him about it really doesn't help. Um, you, Sorry, white, straight males, you don't get to decide like what's discrimination or not, because you don't know what it means. Uh, I had a little story at the other one that I'll repeat where Randall Thomas came to my wedding in Texas and had to drive two hours through the middle of nowhere, Texas, at night with his white girlfriend. And he complained about that. And I got an argument with him. I'm like, dude, I know this part of Texas is not that bad. Uh, and then I thought about it a little and went, you know, I should shut up. I'm a white dude. I don't know what it's like to drive across Texas as a black dude. Um, and not all of you, but a lot of you are white straight guys. Um, you don't know what it's like, so just kind of shut up when someone says, hey, maybe that's not cool. Say, okay, you know, maybe, maybe I could, maybe I'm doing everything I think I could, but I could be a little better when someone says, hey, that's sexist. So that's kind of really all I had to say. Hi, I am uh, this lead bot here is what that actually says. When I went to Japan, nobody really understood. Uh, they <laughs> kind of don't get the whole uh, writing numbers as letters thing, so uh, that'll come up here on Wikipedia and you can learn all about it. This is a picture I took in Japan. Uh, so I got hacks. You are going to die <laughs> by me. Not really. I'm not actually going to be the one who has the hand in it. You're killing yourselves very slowly. Uh, this is Ray Kurzweil. He's a guy who doesn't think that you're going to die. Uh, you can buy some pills from him if you think that he's right about that and then become a robot someday. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Sitting is specifically what I'm talking about that is killing you. We all sit for a living, uh, like it's our job or something. 
and it kind of is. Uh, this is the whole internet, and I found this uh, little nugget of truthiness. Uh, you can tell that's where the truthiness came from because there's the URL right there. Uh, this is called Sitting Kills. It's an infographic that never lies. Uh, sitting increases risk of death up to 40%. If you sit for six hours per day, you are up to 40% likelier to die within 15 years than someone else. Uh, next, it makes you big boned. As you can see at the top, one in three Americans is obese. Uh, exercise rates stayed the same, but sitting time increased 8% and obesity doubled. Sitting wrecks your body. When you are sitting, electrical activity in your leg muscles shuts off. Calorie burn drops to one calorie per minute. The enzymes that help break down your fat drop to 90%. After two hours, your good cholesterol drops 20%. And after 24 hours, insulin effectiveness drops 24%. So this is me sitting. And as you can see, I am not a happy man, right? <laughs> so the solution is a standing desk, right? Everyone can just stand and sit. See, look at that man. That man's much happier standing at his desk. Not true, right? Here's the thing. Standing and chewing gum. So if you're going to consider a standing desk, perhaps you would just get a pack of gum instead. Uh, what I'm actually proposing is something far more radical than gum chewing. It is, in fact, a walking desk, just like this one, that I built with a treadmill I bought off of Craigslist for $70 uh, and disassembled and made into a desk. And it works a lot better than you would think, so please try it. Uh, these are some treadmill desks that you can buy at Walk and Code. I especially like the programmer model on the left here for cuddle time while you're programming as a pair. Highly recommend it. This is me, and I also have here uh, at the very end a video of me on my walking desk. Look at that guy. <laughs> is he happy or what? Yeah. Uh, good evening. I'm Bryce Curley. I'm Bonzoesque on Twitter. I don't have any slides. I'm actually using OmniFocus for my phone as uh, presentation software. So I'm going to talk about some things I learned from organizing the Miami Ruby Brigade. Uh, first one that I've probably mentioned this to a few people, don't meet at a bar. Uh, we went from like 30 people meetings with great attendance to a three-person meeting, and then one person had a job and then left. And then the other two of us, uh, one, the other guy left in a cop car. Uh, <laughs> always have a, a project or some sort of code. You don't need to make it a big thing. Uh, I did a meeting on one of the uh, model view controller things for Sinatra, the name's escaping me right now. And the presentation lasted about five minutes, but there was a lot of good discussion and we got a lot of good talking in. Uh, cat food, no, that's a shopping list. Uh, if there's a good conversation going, don't kill it, let it continue. If it's like interrupting your presentation, deal with it. And finally, if you're doing a great way to start a meeting is a few Ruby cones for the new people. Uh, they're also great to do if you're Think you're really good at Ruby? Bye. All right. Have a good one. I'm ready. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name's uh, My name's Phil Nash. I work at uh, Mint Digital. Uh, we're a London and New York creative rails agency. We like making cool stuff. That's what we do. Um, you can find us on Twitter. I mean, Twitter. You know. Um, I just want to say today that we need to stop building features. Um, features suck. They do too much. You don't want them. Your users don't want them. Stop doing it. You know, if you build a Rails app, if well, that's probably what we do. If you build a Rails app, you uh, you know very well at the time of release, your app is perfect. It's beautiful. It's sleek. It's uh, it's perfection. That's what you did. Uh, and then you love it. Your users love it. And after a while, whoever somebody is making decisions, telling you to do stuff, uh, clients, maybe your internal creative team. I know I have that problem. Uh, and they find they want more features this feature, that feature, the newest technology, updated design, and the application becomes... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not the app you built. Something's gone wrong. It's an abomination. You dread working on it. Something's you don't want to be associated. And the problem is that features are created and left. Ideas are cheap. We love ideas. Ideas are cheap, but building them is hard. Looking after them is hard. And you end up with a bloated product, a bloated user interface, uh, and an expensive and frustrating uh, code bloat. It's time to cut the crap. That's what I'm trying to say. We need to kill features um, and stop building them. We don't need them in the first place. Um, and there's only one way to properly do this effectively, and that uh, is to test. We love testing. This is what we do. But why aren't we testing what people are doing? Um, we need to test early as possible as well. Um, earlier we mentioned um, MVPs. 
uh, minimum viable product. But why do we, uh, we need minimum viable features almost in order to make sure it's actually something that we want, something your users want? Um, so in order to gather these facts, these um, to test this, we need uh, to uh, we need analytics. We need some sort of analytics. Um, but the kind of the tools out there at the moment are more counters, and counters don't tell us much. Um, so uh, they're not grading, uh, great at discovering behavior, that, uh, which is what we need to know. We need to know whether this feature is making our users behave better for us. Obviously, we probably want to make money at the end of the day, so good behavior ends up with uh, cash. Um, so what we're uh, what we're interested in is finding out a user's flow through the application and where they get up, where they get to and whether our new feature, whether what we've done, is worthwhile and is making uh, making progress for us. Um, so in order to do this, at Mint we have built a gem that we call Pathways, which tracks actions a user takes through an application. Uh, this is a Rails uh, gem, so uh, it, it it just puts out uh, into the log logs the data. Um, uh, what does it do? I don't know it does. <laughs> it logs out what's happening in a user's session, basically, and finds out where they've been, where they're going to, what they've done. Um, separately, we then parse that data from the log uh, and load it into MongoDB. Um, we do this because then you can analyze it. You can analyze it beautifully because we can map reduce all over that stuff. And we, we've saved the data so you can find out whatever you want about it later at, at a later date. So we can find out what features are being used, what features aren't being used, what's, you know, what's actually working. Um, it's very simple to implement. You include the gem and do that, and it's done. Um, you probably need MongoDB as well if you want to then go on and uh, check out what, 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 what your data is. But the aim for Pathways is these things. Only have the features that validate their value and remove the ones that don't. Get rid of them. You don't need them. Your users don't want them. Get rid of them. And this will allow us to maximize the return on product development for both clients and our own products uh, and have complete confidence that what we're developing will have a meaningful effect. And we'd like you to do the same because I don't want your extra features. I don't want that. <laughs> it's, you know, extra fluff is just nothing. So, we obviously want help, you know, it's on GitHub, it's version 0.0.7, so get involved and, and use it. Um, so, and, and give us your feedback. If you don't agree, tell me, but you know, I, 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 don't, want, I don't want extra features. So anyway, thanks very much. Um, go check it out, go check out Mint, go check out Logical Friday as our tech blog, um, in which we also talk a bit more in depth about this as well, and don't garble through it in five minutes like I've just done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, everybody. No slides. Real quick. Uh, I have an announcement. Uh, Mendicant University is going to be running for the month of October what we're calling the Magnificent Mendicant Mentoring Month. So we're going to be holding two events. Um, next week, we're going to be doing an MRI documentation drive. So we want to get MRI, you know, uh, especially 193 documented. So if you're new to open source and you haven't committed yet, come in. Our mentors are going to work with you. We're going to try and get as much documented as possible. Uh, and then later in the month, let me see here, October 21st through the 23rd, uh, we are going to be connecting developers with organizations doing socially valuable work, and we're going to work together in, again, doing the mentoring thing and hopefully get people involved and help these organizations build out some of the, the software that they need. Uh, all of the information you can find online on our website, uh, university.rubymendicant.com. And on Twitter, we're mendicant underscore news. Thank you. Okay, so when I stuck this up on uh, the Lightning Talk, I called it Tones and Flavors of Regional Ruby Conferences. And I was going to spend a few minutes and talk about uh, the different conferences that are held each year and how they differ. Because every conference is a very, all the regional conferences are very unique. The personality of the organizers. Uh, tend to come through really strongly, and uh, I'm in a position where I get to go to quite a few conferences every year, so, um, but I decided not to do that, so take that out. Um, by the way, I'm Kobe Ranquist. I'm at Kobeer on Twitter. I'm also at Confreaks on Twitter, and I work at a company called G5 in Central Oregon. Um, those are all the conferences that were held in the United States. Actually, that's not all of them. 
Those are all the conferences I managed to get on the slide that are held in the United States that are regional Ruby conferences. Okay. So th that's my opinionated list of conferences that are worth going to. And for the ones I left off, um, you can stone me later. Um, so I also organize a couple of conferences. Uh, coming up in February of 2012 is the Los Angeles Ruby Conference. Uh, we're holding it in Burbank this year. There's the URL. It's the fourth time we've ran the conference. We actually run it a little bit differently. There's two days of training and then a one-day single-track conference. Um, calls for proposals should be open in October. Follow LA RubyConf for updates. And then the other conference I'm involved with is Ruby on Ales. Um, go to ruby.onales.com. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, the topic really is, or it really is ale. Uh, we hold the conference in Bend, Oregon. Population's about 90,000 people. We have nine, ten microbreweries, um, 11 microbreweries. Um, it's March 1st and 2nd. That's a Thursday and a Friday. We schedule it that way so you can spend Saturday and Sunday either snowboarding, drinking, or skiing. Um, fly into Redmond, Oregon, not Washington. Call for proposals also open in Oregon. Uh, conference does include free beer. It starts being served at 9 a.m. Um, <laughs> and follow our Beyond Ales. Um, if you go to the website, it's actually... Uh, Lightcap and Mike Taus are here. They're co-organizers on RBI on, or Ruby on Ales. Um, that's all I've got. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Desmond. I work for Patch Media in New York, uh, where I'm a Rails developer. On Twitter, I'm Desmond Monster. And if you're like me, you spend a lot of time writing code. Perhaps this code. So, you know, we spend a lot of day writing code, and that's cool, and a lot of this stuff makes sense. It's obviously a little simpler. Um, so, I can't get the thing to show up on the screen. So, the thing... So, here's Vim, and so everything is cool, and you're running along, and everything makes sense, because we're developers, and we like things to make sense. And then you come along, and then... Well, all right. Never mind. This is what I wanted to show. Thanks, anyway. Yep. Uh, my name is Gary Bernhardt. Some things you guys might know me by. Python versus Ruby, a battle to the death, was a uh, pretty popular talk online last year. The Unix Chainsaw this year. Base, the universal base class, which I hope you guys are all using. <laughs> Thank you, except for Evan. Uh, and Destroy All Software, which is my screencasting company. So I'm not going to talk about any of those things. Uh, I'm actually going to show you something that no one has seen except for Corey Haynes and Tom Crayford. I accidentally a whole web framework, unfortunately. And uh, you're actually seeing it right now. And I'm going to show you this app before I explain it to you. It's pretty much the simplest possible thing. I have an index. I have a new. I can put stuff in. It goes to create, redirects to show and then back to index and the post is there. Now, <coughs> this is basically the entire app. There are no controllers in this web framework. Uh, and this create, for example, actually expands into this route. In fact, if I comment it out and go back through this again, it'll do the same thing it did the first time. And what's going on here is that I'm saying I have a route that takes posts to the root URL. It delegates to record.create. On success, it redirects to the show, uh, whatever URL corresponds to show. And if this exception is raised, then it renders the new action. So this is basically that stupid method that you've all written 500 times. <laughs> or let the scaffolding generate for you, but generated code sucks. The nice thing about this is that you can use this simple form, but you can start overriding stuff like maybe you want validation, I can't type validation error to go to something else, whatever. Now, <coughs> this, this router is basically routing on both sides of the, what is equivalent to the controller. It routes in and then the stuff, the code does something and it routes out. But the question is, when it routes into the code, how does it know how to call the method that you have? You, there's no controller, so there's no giant object with a million methods on it that have everything, unless you're using base, which you should be. <laughs> now, so <laughs> the way that it works, let me, uh, let me hit one of these pages. Let me hit new. Uh, as Raptor's going through, it realizes it needs to delegate to record.new and it infers the arguments to that method based on the signature. So you can see here, uh, Raptor also includes presenters. 
it inferred that the presenter takes a record, so it figured out that the record it made earlier is probably the right one and shoved it in there. Now, is this a good idea or not? Like most of my projects, like base, probably not. But it does make uh, the code incredibly simple, and the wonderful thing that happens is that all the objects in your app become naked Ruby objects, no base classes, which means they're extremely easy to test because everything is injected through these arguments. Raptors is sort of a web framework, but really it's a giant router that is also a dependency injector. That's mainly what it is. So, <coughs> uh, I have lots of extra time. Let's talk about this. Uh, <laughs> so, Raptor has presenters baked in. It, uh, it, it, it renders everything through a presenter. In fact, it's impossible to get something into a template that doesn't go through a presenter. And uh, instead of this ugly long syntax, I have this other syntax, which is takes record, which defines your initializer for you. And then I just gave it the rspec let, which actually is just alias method to uh, define method. Don't tell anyone that, because it makes me sound much less smart. But uh, if you, whoops, I typed get instead of let. Uh, if I let these guys, they get super short, and your app turns into this just sequence of declarations of how this model object turns into uh, template variables, right? And the model object is the only guy in play. Of course, as soon as you do something complex, God damn it, say this. Say post creates post.create. Do not <laughs> let the model do it. But, uh, yeah, I've lost my train of thought. So this is a crazy idea. I don't know whether this is a good way to build applications, but if you're interested in it, it is on GitHub. I just made it public like five minutes ago. So you can be, uh, you can be follower number three after Tom and I. And uh, yeah, I have no idea. I would love to hear what you guys think about this because I don't know what I think about it. But that's it, thanks. So actually I wanted to show you um, the awesome bot factory, which is a side project. It doesn't let you build a Twitter bot, but bots for your campfire chat. And kind of here we go, you don't see it at all, but anyway, maybe like this. So we found it pretty hard to consume the the um, HTTP stream. So we thought it must, should be easier to build a campfire bot. So this is basically it. So it's a node app, and <laughs> so you just build a rack application which returns JSON and it pushes to your campfire chat. Check it out on <laughs> GitHub. <laughs> okay. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right, hi. My name is Joshua Valenko. I recycled my slides from my previous talk. Um, but just in case uh, you wanna follow me on Twitter, Manhattan Metric, on GitHub, I'm Jay Belank. I work for Patch. I don't have any slides, but I do have some code. Okay. Shh. Okie doke. Okay, so um, I know Matt's has promised us in uh, Ruby 2.0 there are going to be keyword method arguments, um, but I decided that I was impatient and I would do it first. So I wrote a gem called keyword, and here's what keyword allows you to do. You can basically, in your class, say, oh, I don't know what is going on here. Ooh, that's some crazy. All right, well, okay, there was a class above that. Okay, so um, you can either uh, define underscore keyword underscore method or def k for short. Uh, it works just like def uh, define method. Whoa. All right, well, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, and, and, okay, and then you can call it like this. So, just by passing in a hash. Okay, how does this work? So actually, the seed of this was placed a while back when I filed a bug against Ruby. And I said, proc curry behavior is inconsistent, right? What happens is when you curry a method or curry a proc, you're supposed to get singularity methods back, right? A chain of singularity methods, but you don't if you have optional, well, anyway. Long story short, I uh, kind of waxed poetic a bit on this bug report and, uh, <laughs> and, and further down I said, hey, you know, if you had uh, procs that could curry the way I wanted them to, you could automatically implement keyword methods. 
And that's exactly what I did. So we start off with curry proc, which inherits from proc, but not really, just so I can claim it's a proc. And um, I, I also have to file a bug because apparently if you call lambda and don't pass it a block, it still forms a lambda from the block on the top of the stack, but it throws an exception. Yeah, so anyway, um, pr it works with proc without errors, but not with lambda, so you know, just turn off the warnings, whatever. It still works. Um, then all I'm doing is I'm going through and I'm getting the parameters and putting them uh, into an array, which I then pop them off one at a time, uh, pushing the arguments back onto another array, and then that way when the array is empty, I, uh, I have all my arguments, right? So this is just the curry proc, right? How do we turn that into... Uh, Keyword, uh, keyword proc? Well, keyword proc, it's, it's the same sort of thing that I uh, put in the bug report, actually simplified a little. So all you really do is once you have your curry proc, you just keep calling the curry proc with method, or I'm sorry, with values from the hash that was passed in as args um, until you no longer have a proc and then you have a return value, so you return it. Um, and then the way to turn that into a defined method type thing is unfortunately, uh, and this is what I wrote like five minutes before these talks started, um, unfortunately you have to actually call inside of define method. You can't actually just pass uh, the keyword proc because um, yay Ruby, Ruby doesn't actually call call on the procs that you pass to define method as a proc. It does something under the covers, so uh, you know, put the proc inside a proc and it works. <laughs> So uh, that is a uh, keyword. I just pushed the gem. Um, I just pushed to my repo. The tests all break. Don't use it in production, but it's a lot of fun. So what the heck. OK, uh, let's go to Shiba Ruby Restaurant at Tokyo, Japan. Uh, I am Toshiaki Koshiba, Ruby Kaigi staff. Uh, Tokyo Ruby Kaigi, uh, I held this event, and uh, Ruby um, I can't use English. Uh, this is the support of my coworker and Google Translate. Uh, <laughs> let me say, ko, do you know Japan? And you, uh, have you ever been to Japan? Japan is very hot, hot. Earthquake, tsunami, typhoon, rubisti. Uh, and Tokyo, uh, Tokyo Alpha user group. Uh, 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 Shibuya Rubis Ranch, uh, one of them. Uh, Shibuya is, um, uh, 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 Let's go to lunch together. Oh. And let's come to Hot Japan. Let's come to Shibuya Ruby Lunch. Quick start. All right, this, this, uh, re please read it. <laughs> and uh, detail, uh, see, please see this URL. Hello, Japan, let's come to Shibuya Ruby Lunch. Once more, hot, uh, let's come to Hot Japan. Let's come to Shibuya Ruby Lunch. Thank you very much. Okay, my name is still Evan Light. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at elight, and I uh, usually tweet an awful, awful, awful lot. I got like 20,000 of them. I have a little bit of a problem. Anyway, that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about um, conferencing different. So um, how many people in this room have strong opinions about software? Show me, uh, clap, clap. Yeah, I kind of figure you do. Okay, how many people in this room during this conference have disagreed with something that they've heard a presenter say at some point during this, this uh, conference? Clap. Okay, cool. That's what I thought. So let me ask you this one. Why are you guys sitting in the audience then instead of in the front talking? There isn't enough time. Yeah, okay. That, 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 that's certainly one reason. Um, light, doing a lightning talk is certainly an alternative as well. But what I'd propose is maybe we should hold different kinds of conferences rather than just the conventional kind where some talking head at the front of the room like me who can talk a mile a minute just talks to you and you just sit there and listen. Maybe we actually get together and we discuss things? And oh shit, okay, I'm out of here. Um, but that's good, that's productive. Disagreement is productive, that, that's, that's the point. So. <laughs> And, and you, sir, have seen the life of Brian, and you're an individual, right? Okay. So, um, right. So my point is that maybe we should consider having things like open space events, where we actually get people together, they self-organize, they figure out what's important to them at the time, and then they discuss, they hack, they do whatever is appropriate. I think conferences are really good 
for especially beginners or people who want to get, say, a survey of what there is to learn. They might be pretty good for intermediate people who are looking to, to learn what are the latest and greatest best practices. I think that they're in all, this conference especially draws out you know, a lot of the wackos, I mean the experts, people who have been doing Ruby forever, people who live and breathe Ruby all the time, people who run conferences, you know, that sort of thing. And these are all people who could be at the front of the room, but only so many of them can be. You get these people together, like in the hallway, then there are some really cool things that come up in discussion, but they don't get shared with everyone else. So what I propose is you go Google this term open space technology, go read about it in Wikipedia. Consider either, if you run a conference, consider either making your conference an open space, not all of them please, we, we need to have real conferences too, but consider making an open space event near where you are. I run one, it costs about $4,000 a year. It's very cheap, I never have any problem getting sponsors. We always fill up now. And if you need any kind of advice on how to get started, I'm, I'm glad to, but I just wanna see more of them. I run one, I think there needs to be a lot more. That's really just about the gist of it. Uh, I probably have more time than I need, but so um, I guess the other thing I'll mention then, because I just a little bit, I have a little bit of time left over, and I was gonna do a second lightning talk, and I don't have my laptop here for it. I also do a lot of remote pairing, completely different topic. And uh, since I don't have my laptop, I can't give you a demo. But um, some people were curious about how I do my remote pairing because I do so damn much of it these days. The really, really short version is I, I port forward to uh, SSH on my machine. I um, have a couple of scripts that I've just did that I'm perfectly willing to share with people that let me create accounts on demand given a username and an SSH key and then that person can SSH in. We use Tmux, you can use Screen, either one of them, they're both open source and free. That lets you share the same terminal, and then once you're in the same terminal, you use, oh my God, something like Vim or Emacs to actually edit the same code at the same time. And that can be pretty cool, and you use something like VoIP to talk. And uh, that's really it in a nutshell. So um, I mean, remote pairing is, is really a piece of cake. If you haven't tried it, you really should. Um, some people like me kind of live by it because I live in the middle of nowhere and uh, there are no other Rubyists around, unfortunately. Um, if, you have any, if you're curious at all about remote pairing, uh, I'm gonna blog a little bit about it more, but at the same time, willing to help you guys get set up if you're curious or if you want to experiment with remote pairing, you haven't done it before. I have a link to a calendar on um, Google Appointments where I'll pair with anyone on open source stuff or you know, just to play around, maybe Conway's Game of Life or something. Uh, yeah, if it's an open source, I'll, I'll help, sure. Yeah, um, and uh, that's about it. Hi, <laughs> my name is Ayumu. I'd like to introduce Robcat <coughs> in this talk. Uh, but first, I'll introduce myself. And I'm, I'm working at Accenture as <coughs> senior system analyst, and I'm the newest Ruby committer <coughs> since September. <laughs> so, look, <coughs> so look at this chart. Uh, Ruby committer ranking as of today, and uh, this is me, and me. Yeah. <laughs> so also, I am a committer of Loka, and Loka is a cloud-optimized CMS written by Komagata-san, uh, who lives in Japan. Uh, Komagata-san was uh, spending a lot, long time using WordPress at his job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, last time, uh, when he finished the project using WordPress, uh, he, he made this first version of Loka. Uh, we want to replace WordPress <coughs> because Komasa wants to escape from WordPress at his job. Uh, but he <coughs> we keep keep UI designer uh, friendly and it also be crowd friendly. Uh, Roca is <coughs> easy to deploy, uh, just seven commands. <coughs> and Roca is the uh, <coughs> youngest project, so we need more users and develop <coughs> developers. Please try Roca and <coughs> feedback me. Thank you. <laughs> Okay guys, so my name's Chris Parsons, that's me, that's me on Twitter. So I recently launched a fairly big website and there are a few things that I just wish that we had done before the big launch. Um, the other title could have been not when we're on holiday just after the launch because the launch gets delayed, especially when you're on a campsite with no internet at all. So the site was a UK government site. Uh, it's epetitions.directgov.uk. It's basically the national way of getting in touch with the government to petition about an issue. It's built in Rails. We built it in six weeks. It was an agile process. Now, we only had six weeks to build this with a small team. The team told us that based on the previous traffic, we needed to rate this for 10 requests a second, roughly. So pretty low traffic. So we decided to launch it on a fairly quiet weekday. 
um, except that this is what happened the next day. <laughs> Don't know if you, any, any of you guys saw that. So this is the kind of traffic we actually got. So we couldn't have predicted that, but there are a few things that I wish we'd done differently. Um, the first thing is not to trust your hosting provider, especially when they're a, a government hosting provider who's not used to moving that quickly. So um, AKA send emails asynchronously, always, always, always do this. So they said, sure, ICMTP servers can cope with as many emails as you can send. They just can't, especially when you're testing with example.com and Postfix cuts that out almost at the first hurdle. So, so that was something we just didn't think of in, in the time we had. The second thing is don't just use New Relic. New Relic is great and testing the application is great, but you also need monitoring on the app. You don't want to be installing this after the fact when your website is on national news and you, you are looking at the TV to find out when your next traffic spikes are going to come. So um, you want monitoring at that point. You don't want to be installing it at that point. So use JMeter to test your load as well. That's really important. JMeter is a great tool that allows you to kind of simulate real traffic. Uh, but make sure that you run it on the latest deployed code <laughs> rather than running it on code and that worked two weeks ago and then the hosting company decide to change the firewall the night before the launch. Um, don't ask about that. So three things, three things you really want to check before you launch. Thank you very much. So if you guys haven't seen Twitter Bootstrap, it's a, uh, a set of styles and JavaScript that uh, Twitter provides to get sites up and running. It's great, it's awesome, it's got a full grid layout, uh, it's got markup, uh, you know, great typo typography and stuff. It even comes with great forms. The one problem is that forms, just like always, are a pain in the ass to, uh, to design uh, within Rails. Uh, you have to deal with, you know, error markup and handling. Uh, and especially the Twitter ones look great, but they have their own kind of idiosyncrasies and you have to put divs with clear fixes around them. So with that said, I made a DSL. Looks like Formtastic, but it's a lot simpler. Uh, it wraps things uh, and then you get something like that in that amount of code. Uh, and that's with no additional custom CSS or markup. It works right out of the box. Um, that's it. Oh, that's good. Okay, imagine there's a picture of a, uh, a big mountain there in a hill, uh, and it's called Shialian. It's a real pointy hill. Look, it's here. There you go. <laughs> um, and the Romans, Roman maps, that was the tallest hill in Scotland, according to the Romans, but it's actually about three or 400 metres smaller than Ben Nevis. I was thinking about Martin Fowler. I think one said... All software methodologists are all standing on top of these hills saying, hey, my hill's bigger than yours. I'm at the top. And a lot of debate is, is getting a bit more like that. And there's a lot of some of the debate in this community, sometimes, not always, is, and your hill sucks. <laughs> my hill's much better than yours. So how do we get there? What, what are people thinking? Um, a while back, I did some... Neurolinguistic neuro programming, which is maybe 8% um, pseudoscientific nonsense uh, with some interesting little gems inside. One of the things is a hierarchy of values. You take a hierarchy of values, you take, you, you're doing things because you value certain things. So XP values are communication, simplicity, feedback, courage, respect. In the second edition uh, white book, Kent Beck listed some other uh, values that are not XP but might be valid, like safety, security, predict predictability, quality of life. Maybe valid values to have, they're not XP values. We do things, we, we decide we're in different camps often because we have different values. Testing and development. Maybe things you value in testing and development might be confidence, refactorability, design, specification. Two people might value those things, but the hierarchy of values, you've you got, you got to rank them. And maybe, maybe somebody values confidence, refactorability, design, and documentation. Somebody else values design, values the design side of things, the documentation side of things, more than maybe the confidence building. What's going to happen? Two pe the people are going to choose different, different methodologies, different ways of doing things. Just saying, your way sucks, isn't really going to help. Let's have a th um, if, we, if we think about why people are doing things, maybe question values, maybe accept that people have different values, or maybe, maybe have a debate on the values rather than the actual methodologies. That's all.
Don't say that you're doing it wrong. That sucks. Do say, doing, doing something this way, you'll gain this, this, and this, but you might lose that and something else. That's, that is all. I had a too long to read. Minus one. So I just want to talk real quick about Ruby Parser. Um, it branches off a of parse tree, which is this capable. It's able to run on 1.8, and it parses 1.8, and it doesn't do much else. Ruby Parser, however, runs on both 1.8 and 1.9. It just doesn't parse 1.9. So I want to fix that. I want you to fix that. We have a large suite of tests. They run incredibly fast, and getting up and running is actually not that hard. I have 16 conditional failures and errors that uh, only run under 1.9. I want those gone. So I got six failures and 10 errors. I'm going to pay $50 a fix. First solution per failure wins. GitHub.com, CLRB, Ruby Parser, fork, fix, push, submit a pull request. One requirement that you really need is to gem install isolate, then run rake. It takes care of everything else. I'm available here to help you get started. Eric Hodel can also help you, a lot of other people. Thank you. All right, hey everybody. My name is John Paul Ashenfelter. I'm gonna be talking about muscle-driven development. Um, hopefully this will come through in a second, and if it doesn't, I'm just gonna talk, because honestly, I'm really lucky. Um, I'm just gonna go without the slides. I had a complete and utter lightning talk fail, because basically my talk is what Jonan said. Um, so if you remember about sitting and all that kind of stuff, that's exactly what I was going to talk about. Now, the good things about that is my talk's going to be shorter and get us back on schedule, get us closer to beer. The other thing that's good about it is there's now a treadmill desk Ruby community. At least two of us. <laughs> Ray, that means I have customers. Thank you very much. I'm all ready to do the MVP for the win here. So problem with coding, you're sitting at a desk, you're eating crap all the time. All right, in New Orleans, the crap is a slightly higher level of crap that we've been eating. I'm not going to talk about what drinking does to you, but we're just going to leave it at that. That's a problem, right? I like underpants gnome solutions to things. There's a step one where we keep doing what we've always been doing, collecting underpants, right? Except in this case, it's coding. Then there's this mysterious step that somewhere leads to where we want to be, which is health. All right, I hope you want to be healthy. I want to be healthy. And the thing that I think can get us there is the treadmill desk. Picture Jonan again on the treadmill desk, since this is just a big, pretty blue screen for your imagination to make whatever it wants to make of it. Right here, I'm looking at the 60 benefits of doing, oh, I figured out, look, it's not even connected, that's why. Um, so, <laughs> lightning talk fail number two. So I got 60 benefits for why it's better to uh, be uh, using a treadmill desk than sitting on a normal desk. We'll see, this is all up on GitHub, we'll get to it. Um, so, oh yes, woo! Um, so the benefits I'm going to pull out about that, see if any of these are things that you're interested in. Weight loss, maybe. Reducing stress and depression. Boy, do I get depressed looking at some of the rescue projects I get. If there was something, just some magical way I could get that done better and easier and happier, I'd love to do it. I would love to improve my memory, for instance, plugging all the cords in. Who knows? And, the absolutely best hacks in programmer land. No extra time, no extra effort, no extra motivation. So let's talk real quick about the mathematics of weight loss because that affects a lot of people. Does anyone know, uh, does anyone, well, just screw it. How many pounds are in a calorie? Did you know there's 3,500 calories in a pound? That's a lot of calories to burn. Do you know how much walking burns off? You saw the graph, maybe you didn't see the scale when Jonan showed it. Any rough idea? Shout it out. 150 calories an hour roughly. It depends on your weight and how fast you're going. So that means it takes 23 hours of walking a week to burn off one pound. That is a lot of time out of the office. It's four and a half hours of walking a day, or as I like to think about it, nine Pomodoros. <laughs> so finding a treadmill. All right, this is how we're going to solve it with a treadmill desk. Treadmills are cheap. They're cheaper right after New Year's resolutions fail in February. I'm not making that up. That's a fact. <laughs> So there's another hack for you. In all seriousness, Costco usually has one on sale every month for 500 bucks. You can find good ones at Craigslist or good, Goodwill. Goodwill has really cheap ones, and they're usually pretty spectacular. So you can build one. This guy built one, and you can't really see what it is. That's styrofoam that it's sitting on and a piece of plywood. So it's not expensive once you've got the treadmill. So he has the $39 desk uh, for treadmills. That's what he calls it. You can buy one. I bought the $39 polycarbonate shelf the, from uh, Surfshelf. 
You can buy a Trek desk. You saw what that looks like. If you've got $5,000 extra dollars sitting around, Anthro will sell you the whole package and something that's beautiful and amazingly expensive. So pro tips, you can start research from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, James Levine does a lot of research with walking. 0.8 miles per hour. 0.8 miles per hour is so slow, it makes it hard to walk because you're walking like you're walking through jelly or slow motion or on a higher gravity planet. Uh, track your time. There's an easy way to track your time. The people who made it here, uh, Corey and FabledNet, if they're still around, I use that for tracking my time in Mercury. And you find a time of day that energizes you most. You can experiment with that. If you're not going to do four and a half hours a day of it, if you're just doing two or three hours a day of it, it's totally, totally easy to do. I use it instead of coffee in the afternoon. I found that works a lot better for me. Um, and then because I've got an MVP now and a community and people, Walking code something I've been thinking about doing for a long time, which is a community to do this, so I went ahead and put up something so we can do that. We're going to do something about walking code to help you find the things that you need, to help you track the stuff that you want to track, to help you set goals, help you get to a better place with it. And that's all I have to say. My name's John Paul Ashenfelter. Here's how to contact me. The slides, so you can see the beautiful Underpants Knowns pictures at the beginning, are up on GitHub. And um, I run the Shenandoah Ruby users group for all the people in the central Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, which there's thousands and thousands of that use Ruby, as you can well imagine. But if you're somewhere between, let's say, let's see, for between D.C. and Roanoke, uh, Virginia, let's try that again. Between D.C. Right. and Charlotte, come and see us. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> okay, so um, I was thinking about this recently because I, you know, I was like, Enumerators are awesome, and I discovered a, a method on them that I hadn't seen before, and I thought it was really cool. So I thought I'd just talk about them for a couple minutes. So, you know, in Ruby, you have enumerable, you have like a, a, an array like this, which is basically what I'm talking about. Well, what, what is an enumerator in Ruby? Well, you see, if you call an enumerable method without giving it a block, it actually returns you an object. And that object, you can call things on like next, which will give you the next thing in the, the list of things that you're iterating over if it's something that you're iterating over. Um, so, you know, there's a Ruby doc for it. Um, you can also do other interesting things with these. You can chain them. So, you know how there's a method called each with index um, on enumerable? So you can say, hey, I want to get everything in this array also with the index. Well, it turns out you can take map and append that to it. Uh, and so you call map.withindex, map and that will allow you to map over everything in the array with the index attached to it. And um, it's not, but it, that's not the only thing you can do with those. You can also um, wrap your own methods with uh, enumerators. So say you have a method that yields stuff. Well, uh, in uh, 1.8.7 and 1.9, uh, every uh, object has uh, enum for defined on it. And what that will do is that will take a, um, they'll create an enumerator for that method. And then, so if you call it with a block, uh, it will pass that through, you know, like, and call uh, yield on uh, each, you know, like, and pass that through as the block to the yield. So. That's pretty cool. So you'd get that from that. And that's all I want to talk about. I'm Nick Howard. I'm at, uh, at Broke Bobcat on Twitter and uh, GitHub. And um, if you want to talk to me about Mira, I'd be interested. All right. Hi there. I'm David Cap, and I'm not a cop. Uh, <laughs> so I didn't prepare any slides because my uh, talk isn't technical at all. Um, this is, I just want to uh, bring up a few points about how to communicate with non-native English speakers a bit more effectively. Um, I had the opportunity to live in Japan for a while and I was uh, teaching English there. And uh, there's just a few things you can do that will make a huge difference. And yelling really loudly is not one of them. Um, there, one of the main things that you can do is speak slowly. And you'll see a lot of people request this when they say, I will take questions, but please speak slowly. And nobody does that. <laughs> if you actually speak slowly, it will help them understand you much, much better. Another thing you can do is use short sentences. You'd be amazed at how difficult it is to understand long run-on sentences, especially when you're talking about something technical. 
So if you have some a question for someone, don't look at them and say, I have a whole bunch of questions about enumerators because there's some great things I think you could do if you had blocks and the ability to split up blocks and multiple things. Maybe you could use a splat argument or something like that so I could give multiple blocks at the same time. No one will understand that, even native English speakers. <laughs> Another thing that you can do is speak clearly. And that might sound really simple, but just try and speak in a consistent tone of voice and try and pronounce all of the things you're saying very carefully. Yes, enunciate, that will help greatly. Also, avoid using slang. You'd be surprised how easy it is for slang to sneak into your speech, especially colloquialisms. So if you say something like, hit a home run, that might make sense to some people, but to other people it won't really mean anything if they're not familiar with the sport you're referring to. So I think if you use all of those techniques, it would really help people out a lot. And just give that a try. Oh, I'm sorry, there was one I forgot. And that is check for understanding. It won't be obvious if someone doesn't understand what you're saying, so pause periodically and ask them. You don't have to be rude about it. Just check and make sure they understand the uh, things you're saying, they're following along with you, and if they don't, restate them, state them slowly. If they don't understand the words you're using, try using alternative vocabulary that's more uh, simple to understand. So I think if you try those things, you'll be able to communicate a lot more effectively with people and get your point across without having to yell. Thank you. Oh, what is that? All right, fine. F11. F11. One slide, yeah. That's all I need. Hi, I'm uh, Pavel S. Shumshkovsky, actually, but uh, S is good enough, uh, from Las Vegas. Um, I don't know if many of you have been to Las Vegas, but chances are you haven't been there because of our tech community. And chances are probably you didn't even know that we live in houses. Um, we do. We don't all live in, like, strip, stri uh, strip casinos. Um, <laughs> Vegas. Talking to the microphone, enunciate, got it. Um, so, so Las Vegas isn't known for its tech community, but there are a group of us that are looking to change that. Um, and I'm actually building a tech library, a dead tree tech library with computer books um, and welding books and business books and inspirational biographies and things. It's being uh, funded by, by, uh, excuse me, by my employer. Um, so it's actually, it's built, it's in a, in a fantastic uh, downtown Las Vegas area uh, in the Arts District um, in, in a building called the Emergency Arts Center. It's full of uh, like artists and bohemians and creative people. We're on the second floor right above, right above a coffee shop. Um, so why am I telling you this? Uh, because I hope that if you come out to Vegas, you visit us. And um, because um, there's a lot of really smart people out here, hopefully you guys value books like I do paper books, not just Kindles and stuff. Um, so I would like your suggestions if you have not just not just Ruby books, hopefully, but kind of books that uh, inspire you and you think would inspire other technical people. Uh, so come out to userlib.org. There's a little sign-up form. You can recommend a book. You can put your name down. Um, you know, tell us who you are. Tell us why you think it's an important book, why you'd recommend it to other people. Um, we'll actually put it on the site. Um, and as well, um, I looked at a lot of library management software. Um, it's kind of boring, um, very 1995 era. There's Koha, Open Biblio. Um, didn't like what I saw, I decided to write my own. Um, I started this two days ago. Um, I'll put a, a link up on GitHub, um, uh, cleverly called user share uh, to go with the user lib uh, moniker, two minutes. Um, see? All right, I don't know what that means. But three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Oh, the alarm went off, okay. Um, I can't count either. Um, so yeah, um, that'll be up on GitHub if anybody wants uh, to contribute. Um, and it's not only library software, um, because it's not only a library, there's uh, a co-working area where you can come down, just bring your laptop, free Wi-Fi, um, as well as kind of a, a, a meetup venue, so it needs a room reservation system and, uh, and all kinds of things. So if anybody wants to contribute to software, has ideas, um, I would love to hear them. So stuff about userlib on Twitter or at uh, Makanai, that's me, and I think I'm done early. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I want to talk about uh, the term magic, right? And I feel like the term magic is one of those terms that we've heard a lot about in uh, the Ruby community over the years, um, starting with uh, uh, Rails and constant complaints that Rails was too much magic, quote unquote. And I think magic is a really stupid term. I uploaded this to speaker deck today, and I don't know how to make it work now. 
Um, but we'll go with this and we'll see what happens. Anyway, um, so what is magic, right? So I used to work on this project out in Atlanta uh, that had been going for years and years and years. This is one of the original sort of big Rails projects. I think ThoughtWorks started working on it back in 2006 or 2007. And it's been around forever, right? And, and it's really well tested. Like, it's not bad in that regard. But um, so there's an actual place in England called Lulworth Code, which I thought was awesome. Uh, and at the top, right, the most recent stuff is all like nice, happy greenfield. And as you go farther and farther down, you get your sort of bent domain models down there. And like play school, my first DSL sort of towards the bottom. Like every bad idea that ever entered the Ruby community has been in there at one point. And then Cthulhu lurking at the bottom, right? And everything in that sort of second half, like that was all magic to us, right? None of us had written any of that code. That was beyond the understanding abstraction layer. Uh, that lay beneath the, you know, and the, the shrinking horrors underneath. So that, that's an example of self-inflicted magic, right? We did that to ourselves over the years, right? That was, that was us as a community, as a, as a bunch of developers had, had gotten this to the point where, where it was a certain sort of piece of magic underneath. But that's not usually the way we think of, of magic in those terms, right? Like, if you go back and you look at the history of computer science, there's lots of things that sort of fall into the category of magic that were seen as magic at one point in time. And I made up all these days. I actually don't know if these are true or not. But, like, when I think back to 2006, right, Ruby on Rails is this bullshit magic thing, right? And J2EE is safe. It's not magic. It's super obvious what's going on, right? 1995, oh, automatic garbage collection. You fucking Java hippies and your, your garbage collection shit, right? Taking out the trash. That's what real programmers do. 1973, oh, macros. Macros are super, mac, you know, super magic. But plain old methods are fine. Uh, and me now, I still don't really understand exactly what those Java people talk about when they talk about dependency injection. Uh, but blondies, call me anytime is not magic. It's OK by me. Um, Oh, yeah. And so to me, right, like, it's not just, like, magic and not magic. Like, on stuff on the left is, like, uh, stum you know, stuff on the right is, like, stuff I like and understand, right? It's comfortable to me. It's familiar. And stuff on the left is stum stuff that makes me feel dumb and uncomfortable, stuff that I don't quite get. Um, that, that's sort of outside of my comfort zone. And I think that's, like, magic is an emotional term, right? People take this term magic and they throw all this stuff into the magic category, but it really, it's about a certain amount of comfort level. Things are happening and you don't know why, right? So there are two reasons why you get stuff that makes me feel dumb and uncomfortable. There's I suck, but I'm intrigued, and there's you suck, and so does your vacuum, right? Like, either you're the one who created this vacuum, and magic is your problem, but sometimes the result of magic is a really good thing where you have a dialogue about, like, well, you know, I'm really intrigued by this crazy Lisp stuff, and maybe macros are super cool, and so you go out and you learn a bunch about it, right? And you, I don't know, maybe you do metaprogramming, you create a huge mess, and some of that magic that we talked about earlier. Um, you know, so for example, like code that writes, code that writes, code that writes, code is an example of magic to some people. Uh, you know, turtles upon turtles, that's just, I just happen to like that picture. Uh, code that just does things, right? Stuff's happening, I don't know why. Um, convention over configuration, right? Like there's some magic aspect to that, right? If you don't know what the conventions are, two minutes, if you, uh, if you don't know what the conventions are, then that can, that can look like magic to you because stuff is just happening. Um, and a lot of times it's code that does things that I used to do myself. And I know what happened when I did it myself because I had to fucking do it myself. Uh, but now someone else does it for me. Sorry, that was a lot of swearing. Um, uh, Adder accessor in private. When I first saw Ruby, I thought this stuff was amazing, right? Adder, like, it, it just gave me a, an accessor method that's like, that's like super cool and like private. You like, you just slap private on once and you get like all of your methods underneath private or like magically all private. And in Java, I used to fucking put private in front of every single stupid method and it was awful. Uh, and that's a good kind of magic. That was great. Um, but magic is also a little difficult to reason about. You don't know what it's coming from. Like, what are the conventions? How is this stuff coupled together? How does this change the coupling relationship in ways I don't really understand? How easy is it to break free of those conventions once they're established? Um, and is it too complex. Um, but the way you dispel magic, right, is through understanding. Uh, you go from ignorance to knowledge, right? You go from com complexity to simplicity as you understand what's going on. And the person who's creating the magic, who's creating those problems, can do it by, by helping to uh, advocate, by document, you know, to, to, uh, to go out and do this stuff, right? But the point is that, like, so, so the, the Clark, right, the classic Clark quote, any sufficiently advanced technology is, is indistinguishable from magic, but there's no such thing as magic, right? Magic does not exist one minute. Um, um, <laughs> There's no such thing as magic. Magic is a stupid term. The difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. Magic is the wrong word. What you want is something else. Um, you can dispel it through documentation, through education, refactoring for clarity, simplification. Uh, that's the right amount of magic. Um, this is some stupid blog post from 2006 where it's like, sometimes too much magic is too much magic. And then one of the commenters comes along and says, like, oh, the magic field blocks, the untyped nature of every. Like, that's not fucking magic. That's just bullshit. Uh, do try interesting things. Do not poke yourself and others with the sharp end of a pointed stick. Uh, if you've ever been down this path, right, zero to six months Ruby, total noob sauce. Three to six months hardened Ruby veteran, uh, you've been doing it for a little while. In between that, you have to go through a period where you're danger to yourself another three seconds. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know who you are. Thank you, thank you. Uh, one moment. Um, okay, I s just start talking. Um, who in here doesn't know what Sinatra is? Okay, leave. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, uh, this down here, that's Sinatra. Um, apparently there is this new Sinatra 1.3 thing, which has a fancy streaming API, um, which you can even use to implement like a messaging service in two lines. Uh, it supports the patch, patch web, has logger support and so on. Anyway, you wanna have that and we wanna try to, to install that and then you go gem install Sinatra version 1.3.0 and oh, what the fuck. <laughs> so let's fix that. Dum -dum -dum. <laughs> oh, it's running the test now. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, it has passed. <laughs> okay, anyways, I, I just keep talking in the meantime. We also do a Sinatra, I'll also push a Sinatra 127 release where for, for uh, if you are running on 186, which you shouldn't. Um, and there's a hot new Sinatra Contrib project, which I'll push out in a second. Um, <laughs> uh, the Sinatra Contrib project is basically a collection of extensions with the promise, w of common extensions with the promise that for every Sinatra release, there'll be uh, a release of Sinatra Contrib where all the extensions are compatible, so you can use them without worrying about the future. Um, and we also have a Sinatra recipes project up. I post, this is a blog post. I currently have that locally, but I'll push that as soon as I've made the release. So. Pushing to Ruby gems. <laughs> yes, hotel Wi-Fi. <laughs> Anyways, this, this streaming API is really fancy. You can like, um, so what's this going to do is it's going to write, it's gonna be legend, then it's waiting for half a second, then it's saying, wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> then it's waiting for another second, and then it's saying diary. <laughs> and, and you can, keep the connection open on some servers and then write to them later so you can implement a chat server and no li like no lines at all, like just a few lines. Um, okay, while we're waiting, just I'm gonna try something fancy and. I know we're doing uh, signed tags, but that means that the gem is on Ruby gems now. Oh, yeah, I'll fix that later. Okay, um, how much time do I have left? Okay. Plenty of time. Oh. What? Oh. oh. Maybe I'll be back. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> uh, I would suspect it's not because uh, we have a test for exactly that. This looks like a Ruby bug. I'm sorry. Thanks. Okay, anyway, so this, uh, this is about RubyConf India. I'm one of the, uh, the organizers for RubyConf India for the last couple of years. Damn it, I had funny slides. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just quickly. I'm going to take like two minutes anyway, so it's cool, I think. Yeah, anyway, so I'm one of the organizers from way back for RubyConf India. And uh, I 
figured I'd take this opportunity to, to, to invite you guys to come visit. We're doing Rubicons India for the third year in a row in February and March next year. Um, so yeah, um, this, is, uh, this has been going on since 2009. We've had about 400 or 500 people show up every single year. And uh, we've had a few people come from outside the country, but we'd love to see more. Um, this year, the talks going, uh, the the conference is going to be in uh, in Pune, in Maharashtra, in India, and uh, you can contact me for more information. What we're looking for is people that can uh, come and speak, send in proposals. I think our CFP should start in about a month's time. Uh, you can watch the website, which is rubyconfindia.org, or the Twitter uh, account, which is rubyconfindia. And uh, yeah, we'd, we'd love to see more, more people come from outside India and speak. And yes, of course, we're looking for sponsors. So any of you that can talk your companies into paying us money to do this, that would be awesome. Thank you. So uh, I'm decoder of VIT, this uh, benchmark gem. Uh, we, we'd like to do it actually as a framework to complete the standard library, which is very simple. VIT means speedy or fast. It's a French word. So you basically can run benchmark, have reports like this, and uh, you can make some uh, pretty graph, and you have benchmark too. So we can see uh, some output. So this kind of stuff you can easily do. The command line is very simple. You do some uh, RVM exec, vit run, and you're, you're gone. I'm not do it here because it's uh, taking quite a time if you want correct results. So we are only at the start of the project and uh, if you have any idea, uh, just ping us. It's uh, at uh, github uh, blambo slash vit if you want. And so that's it.